Thank you. So I'll try to keep it um, brief. Um, so I'm going to talk about uh, reference cells, and these are like the reference cells you see in uh, Okamo. So just, I'm just trying to separate the problem. So when you start classifying uh, reference cells, there's, there's uh, or local state, there's different um, axi you can classify. The first one is locality, so you won't be able to allocate fresh names, fresh locations on the fly. Um, the second one is being either ground or non-ground, so whether, whether your store, whether your memory can, can store values that can mutate the store itself, things like functions. So you can, this is an example of a reference cell that can manipulate the store again. That's being the distinction between being non-ground versus ground. And the last axis is um, full storage. Okay, so that's whether you can store values uh, in memory that depend on the shape of the memory. So the, the example is a reference to reference to a bool, right? So I can only store a reference to a bool, a reference to reference to a bool if I already have some reference to a bool. Okay, so if I don't have any references to a bool in my memory, I can't store reference to that, assume, assuming I don't have null pointers. Okay, so this is like ML references. Okay, so, so there's three different axes here. The first one has been more or less solved in the sense that we have very good understanding of the semantics of that, of local ground state. Um, the the, the non-ground bit involves solving some recursive domain equation. Okay, so, so kind of trying to solve a big recursive equation for the semantics to, to, to account for the fact that your store can change itself. Um, and the techniques that are already well understood. Um, and the, 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 so what I'm going to focus on today is lo local and full storage, and not not really about non-ground state. And I leave that for later because I think these two are already interesting on their own. Okay, so so I'm going to talk about the semantics for local, full ground state. Okay, without high order. And modeling this kind of effect uh, has been very successful, of course, in operational semantics, uh, but also using techniques from step indexing, so Lars, uh, shout out for you, and others, uh, or using game semantics. Okay, but, but what's not been uh, solved so far is uh, what I call functional semantics. Okay, so that's, that's some kind of unitary semantics that uh, involve sets and structure-preserving functions, so sets with structure and, fu and structure-preserving functions, so things like domain theory, things like sets, things like nominal sets. Um, so I'm interested in this kind of semantics. Um, and that's because it, it, it will make it easier to tie it with uh, the wider body of knowledge of monadic semantics, so make local references tie in very nicely with other kind of stories we understand about computational effects. And another nice thing about this uh, functional semantics is that it's extensional, so you don't have to, you only think about the intermediate steps where they matter. So, so um, I'm, I'm very interested, even just from a scientific point of view, in finding this kind of semantics. I think it will tell us something new about, about this kind of effect, not to detract from any of the other kinds of models. Um, and one, one good reason for doing this, especially the extensional point of view, is that it allows you to validate things like, like effect-dependent compile optimizations, as Casper. Uh, <coughs> spoke earlier today. Um, and, and the reason I came into this, uh, to work on this problem is analysis of ML's value restriction. So I, talk, I spoke about this last year, in last year's HOPE. Uh, so we wanted to, to build models for um, ML's references to understand the value restriction better. And we thought, okay, let's work out the polymorphism. Once, once that, we'll take the models for reference cells, bang them together. But actually, we found that uh, we still don't have very good models for reference cells in this in these terms. So, so me and my collaborator here, Sean Moss, um, want want to build models for of this kind for reference cells. Um, and what I, I will, but I'm not going to talk about more about this anymore today. What I will talk about later is uh, how to give another semantic correctness proof for uh, Haskell's run ST. Um, so that's another application area for this piece of theory. So. Just one thing, before, when I was preparing for the talk, I went through all the maths again, and actually I found a very big mistake. Uh, so, so I have to 
structure the talk around that. So Phil likes to say the theory is your cuddly friend, but like a very good friend, when you're wrong, it tells you so to your face. So <laughs> it did. Um, so what I'm going to do instead today is uh, give a mini tutorial about how these kinds of models are constructed. Um, so that's what I call general setting. And then I'll talk about uh, effect masking, which is, I think, is a crucial property for um, doing the run ST. Uh, soundless proof. And then I'm going to talk about the monads I, the are monads that me, me and Sean have looked at, but, but and I'm going to tell you a bit why they're not quite the right monads for uh, full ground references. Um, and then I'm going to talk about uh, the soundness of run ST. Okay, so um, it's going to be a bit of a short talk because of that, so feel free to int in interrupt and interact, assuming that you'll go home a bit later if you do that, too much of that. Okay, so let's start. So, how do we usually do uh, ground references? Okay, so, so, so how do ground references work? So, I'm, I'm using a, a trick I learned from Paul Levy. Um, so, you can read his, uh, his book or his paper about this. So, what, so what's the setting? So, you have some uh, a parameterization of a language where you have a set C of storable type names, which are going to range over by this uh, Roman C, and a function that assigns to each uh, type name a ground type, and the ground types are just the empty type, sums, the unit type, products, and then a reference to a type name. Okay, so so this, this seems a bit obfuscated, but, but the reason it, this is set up is that it allows, it allows me to talk about uh, recursive or circular data structures without actually incorporating recursion into the semantics. So it's, it's, it's actually kind of quite useful. So it lets you do set theoretic semantics, even though you do have circularity, and, and I'll point out later where that comes in. So again, this is not my observation. This is kind of already out there in the literature. This is a tutorial bit. So he looks at an, let's look at an example. We can have a type name called linked list, right? And then the type we associate to the type uh, to linked lists are either the, the, the list is empty, or we have some bit, uh, and then a reference to another linked list. So that's things you you, you already know. Okay. So that's the first component, uh, these ground types. And, and once you decide what are the storable type names and what types they denote, uh, you can start off. Okay, so the next ingredient you need is a category of worlds. Okay, so uh, what's that? So your objects are just finite numbers, but you think about the finite numbers as a set of all the numbers up to that number, so finite ordinals. And then a function that uh, um, associate to each one of those numbers a storable type name. Okay, so so these, the elements of this ordinal are just locations. So I have W minus one, or sorry, I have W locations in memory, and location zero stores a linked list, location one stores an integer. Here, location zero stores an integer, uh, integer, location one stores a linked list, location two stores an integer, okay? Uh, and the morphisms in this category are uh, Type name preserving injections. So I have, I have one shape of the heap, another shape of the heap, and I explain how one shape maps into another shape. Um, so these have to be injections. I don't merge different locations. They stay, they stay step separated. So for example, if I look at these two worlds or heap shapes, uh, I can map this zero to three, this one to zero, this two to one, and I get this morphism of worlds. Okay, this is just a standard um, structure in this uh, in this kind of semantics. And once you set, once you have the category of worlds, uh, okay, there's some structure you need for it, uh, some kind of separation uh, structure. So the, the the basic one is when you, when you have two worlds, you can put them together uh, separately and, and associate to each uh, location the one it had previously. But more generally, what, what you really need is is this uh, this structure of um, on the, on the cost slice category. So if you have some world and there's two worlds that extend it in different ways, um, then you can close it back into another, extend it into another world, right? Keeping the separate parts the, uh, separate and the uh, similar parts, the, the parts that came from W the same. Okay, so, so this extended world is gonna be um, everything in W1 and W2, but you only count the stuff that's in W just once. So it's the obvious thing what you have to work out the maths to get the indices right. But that's just standard. So I'm gonna, Write like this. You have two uh, embeddings, two extensions of the heap, and this is how I put them together in a compatible way. Okay. So, 
the general setting where these kinds of semantics work, uh, live in, uh, is the category of functors from W to set. Okay, if I was doing a bit more recursive, if I had a bit more recursion in my, in my, in my language, I would replace this with omega CPOs or DCPOs or some, some nicer category. But for this kind of semantic, it's enough to consider functors from W to set. And this category is very well behaved. It's bicat is enclosed, so that means I can interpret the simply types on the calculus. Okay, so a very basic function language. Uh, but what's nice about it, about this particular category is that I can interpret the ground reference types. Okay, so how do I do that? So every type uh, uh, denotes a functor. So uh, this part lets me, lets me interpret the uh, sums and products. And then when I have a reference, well, it, it has to be a functor. So at world W, I assigned it um, I assign it all the locations that have the type name C. Okay, so if I allocated, uh, so in, in this case, if I, if I have the, the world where zero is an int, one, location one is a linked list, location two is an int, then, um, then when I interpret an integer, I have two locations that can store an int, zero and two. Okay, that's the kind of the obvious structure you would do. Uh, and when I have to interpret a morphism, then it's just, if I have some injection from one world to another, just restricted to the locations I care about. So this is what this gives you. Okay, and, and so this is just the general setting, completely standard. Um, and what we want in order to address the question that I, uh, I asked uh, is a monad over this category V. Okay, so, so how do we know we have the right monad? Okay, so, so this, that's the usual kind of question. Um, so of course we want to be able to interpret the um, the operations for uh, reference cells, so allocation, the referencing, and assignment. And we have some equations you want to validate, so, so Levy from 2008 has a nice list of them actually, and you want it to be adequate with respect to some operational semantics, but, but you can be still fairly liberal uh, with, this, uh, with this list, and in particular, we don't really know what all the equations should be, so, so uh, just because you're matching a particular set of equations doesn't mean that you've got the right monad. So, so I was just trying to think about what would be the, the simplest kind of property um, that you would like from, from, that I would like from local state, and that's what, that was effect masking. So I'm gonna spell out what I view as effect masking. Okay, so if I have a monad over this category of pre-sheaves, or functors, I said, we say that it validates effect masking when, when I have two constant functors, gamma and A, so they don't depend on the they don't depend on the um, on what's in the store, so they can't they can't uh, expose locations. And then I have a, fun a program from the environment gamma into into a that perform, performs some local state computation. Then I can ref I can uh, factor it out as some another program that seems pure. So even though it's causing effects in the background, none of these locations permeate or leak out into the environment, and so it should seem pure. Okay and. Once you scratch a bit your head a bit, uh, it's a natural thing to ask for. And actually, if, if you look at the usual local ground state monad, so not full ground references, but just ground references, so you're only storing bets in memory, um, it does validate this. Okay, so it's a natural requirement to ask for. And what I'm going to show you later is that exactly this triangle gives you uh, the, the semantic soundness for runst. Okay, so so even even easier than I expected it would be. So so. So just based on this assumption, you can, you can get that. Yes, yes, Phil. So if I think of M as an input output monad, then one thing I'm Not M, T, T, you mean T. No, yeah. sorry, yes. M is up as a code written in the input. Yes, yes, monad. yes, yes. Um, the one thing I might do is read from the input, and that would not validate the equation you gave, and that means that that particular instance does not satisfy effect mass. Correct, but reading from the input is not local, right? It's a global kind of effect. Right. Okay. Good question. Okay, and yeah, follow Phil's lead and please do interrupt. Um, yeah. Okay, so we're gonna look at two not quite right monads. So I'm gonna look at the first one that I thought was right and then I, as I said, I checked the maths again and yeah, I was wrong. Um, so I'm very briefly gonna go over it. So, um, so we model stores, what's a store? Okay, remember when you, when you look at a global state monad, you pass around some store. So what's the, what's, what's the, what's the type of stores, of the set of stores? It's parameterized by, by two different worlds. The first one tells you the 
shape of the heap, so how many locations are in the heap, and what are the types. And the second one tell you in which world these values live in. And you give this somewhat complicated formula, um, but what it says is, um, in each location I store some value, and that value can live in some future world. Right? And, and the, the way I choose this future world means that I can garbage collect world that I don't really need. That's, that's what this kind of Cohen gives you. It's called the Cohen. Okay, and, and, and what's this, this structure is very obviously, if you, once you know enough things, enough category theory, uh, contravariant in the W prime. What's not so obvious why it's covariant in the W, so yeah, when it's, once, why it's covariant, and that's given by this uh, independent structure uh, plus W. So I'm not, not going to delve too, into too many details here, also because this model is wrong, uh, but I'm happy to talk about it later. Yes? So the idea, sorry, let me just. Mm -hmm. So W prime is the size of, is the heap. It's is the size of the heap, yes. And W is the world each value lives in? Each, uh, each value has to be at least at that world or later. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but again, it's, it's, it, it doesn't actually work out, so okay. don't, don't, I mean, you, yeah, you can spend some cycles on it, but. but. Wait, what, what I'll explain in a minute. Here, this, this one. This, this, bit, this bit is what doesn't really work out. Um, the good thing, the nice thing about this is that once you set things up like this, you can, you get a monad that looks a lot like the local uh, state monad. Okay, so local grant state. It looks just like this, apart from the fact that you only have um, a single W here. Um, and uh, it does validate this effect masking property, so that's kind of nice. But it, yeah, there's some type, type error when you try to define the referencing that I missed when I was defining it. So you, you can kind of define it, but things doesn't type check the, the worlds. Are, you don't have enough, enough data um, to define which world you, you end up in, which, which store you end up in. So, so it's wrong. <laughs> okay, so you, you, yeah, you can do the other operations, but it, unless you can read back from the store, it doesn't really matter. Okay. <laughs> so the other one, add, right, is kind of like the obvious one you, you might try. And this one was suggested by Alex Simpson when I was talking about the other one. Uh, and here you, you, you have a simpler kind of store. Um, so it's the same kind of trick as we discussed earlier, only this time you, you interpret each value exactly at the world you, you, you give to it. Okay, and then you look at a slightly more sophisticated one, one that's given by an end followed by a co-end. And this one does let you interpret the operations, but, but it, it has too much structure. It doesn't identify enough things to, to get the uh, effect masking property to come through. Um, yeah, it's not it's not obvious why this this would be any 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 um, a, a, a good one unless you kind of sit down hard and think about it, do some calculations. I think, or if, or if it is obvious to you, then please come and chat to me. Um, another nice thing about this one is that it explicitly uses this independent structure um, plus, uh, and and this store is much more natural than the other one. But but again, doesn't give effect masking. So yeah. Can you explain what is like? Much yeah, yeah. Yep. So, so this is an end. So it's like a big, 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 big tuple, okay, with some kind of um, compatibility condition on it, okay. And, and and what you end up needing to prove in order to get an effect masking is saying, okay, if I'm in the empty world, right? Does that uniquely sort of captures everything else uh, in, in later worlds? Because I have no way to really inspect the environment I live in unless I already have some access to, 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 to stay. And, and this doesn't really give you that. So, so, so this, this, rest this restricts all the other components you're in, this, this, the first end, um, only on stores that somehow come from, you know, but that, that you get by cutting off uh, everything but the empty heap. Uh, but it tells you nothing about the other components or, or, the, or how these components behave on other on other kinds of input stores and um, so it 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 doesn't yeah it it, it doesn't cut out uh, the computations as much as you'd like uh, and then this on the on the other side this coin doesn't quotient enough things as it should so 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 you have a bit more uh, a bit too much structure in this in this monad that lets you that to let you validate the fact masking I, i'm sorry if it's a bit yeah Okay, I can, yeah? Is that, I mean, is that, I mean, the intuition for this one is the usual thing that it's all like Fall exists, yeah. Another future yeah, 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 yeah. So that's why it's, yeah. 
it, it, yeah, I mean, there's, there's, a bit, there's a bit of subtlety here, which is this W prime and this W second prime, they come from the same W. So somehow you're given some W prime that's hidden from what the, the computation can, can allocate again. Okay, so, so there is a bit of subtlety here, and, the, and the, 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 this independence structure lets you bring them back together. But, it, I mean, it, yeah, it might be some variation on this that, that we're still hammering into it and we have some ideas as to how to proceed. So. We might have a monad mon in between, but, but it, this, this one is, is kind of, as I said, somewhat natural, but still not quite there as far as I'm concerned. Okay? I mean, it's also possible that effect masking is just the right, my formulation of effect masking is the wrong one, right? But, but I'm going to try to at least get, get it. Okay, so let's now look at the run ST, semantics for the run ST monad. Okay, so let's just look. Sorry, yes. Are you now going to show us the right one? Now? No, 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 no. I said I. Right I don't know what the right one. Is. Good question. I don't know what the right one is yet. Um, we still have some ones we're looking at, but they're nowhere near. Um, yeah, I don't want to. I don't want to give you a headache on something that I've not even looked at in, in depth yet. I mean, I've looked at this one. In, in, one side doing something else yes, so, yes, so what I'm going to do now is saying, okay, let's assume we do have, a, we do, I do manage to find a monad that, ha, that has effect masking. How can we use that to validate the uh, run ST, uh, Haskell's run ST construct? Okay, so what would I do if I have this? Yeah, exactly. Great. Right. Thank you for that. Okay, so, so we need some syntax. So. <laughs> We just in include it because it's easy to, to, to interpret all these structures. You just have uh, co-products and products and empty types and new types and uh, abstraction, application of functions and monadic return and bind because it's Haskell. So, so I want to keep it close to that. And then what's the interesting bit? Well, we have some constructs for allocation, the referencing assignment, and then the run ST. So, so the only one that looks a bit in more intimidating is this let ref. Uh, and again, this is something I learned from Paul. It's not, it's not my invention. Uh, so when you have these uh, foreground references, uh, this allows you to um, allocate a, a cyclic data structure all, all, in one, all in one go without having these null pointers floating around. So it just says allocate m1 to take the allocate x1 to xn in memory, give them the values m1 to mn, but m1 to mn can use the references from x1 to xn. So I'm going to show you the tapping rule in a minute. But again, this is standard, but I don't think if many people know that. So. And the alpha are the type, the type variables you get in the runner's T. So it will become clear when I look at, when I show the type system. Great, great, great question. So yes, yeah, so the only place you really need to put it uh, is here. Uh, everywhere else you can infer it from, from, from the type system. Okay, this is why it's there. Okay, and this, yeah, this is a uh, church, oh, this is supposed to be a church style system. So it's supposed to be a type annotation here. I'm sorry about that. And yeah. So yep. is that alpha? An or is it being no, no, we have to put it in the syntax. Um, it, well, it's, it's, yeah, yeah, no, no, that's fine. So, so you have to put this one in, in your term syntax because you, you, you allocate something. You have to say in which region you're allocating it. You, you can't, okay, so, you can't so, just. So, so you're, you're using it, not introducing it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes, fair enough. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so um, so what are the types in the type system? So I have some uh, region variables, and when I have a, a, a finite subset of range variables, I call it a kind. And then I have my types. So what are my types? Are the ground types or products and coproducts? Zero and one are already in the ground types. I have function types, and then I have my t alpha of a, where alpha is one of those region variables. Okay, so this is, should, should look familiar from Haskell. Um, and then my ground types are as before. Okay, so I can only take, again, a reference to one of those uh, ground type names. Okay, so, so what are the new rules, or interesting rules, or relevant rules? So for kinding, uh, I have to show everything is well-kinded, but in particular, um, T alpha i of A is well-kinded when alpha is one of those alpha i's in your kind. Okay, that's what you expect. And your typing judgment, so I'll get back to this in a minute. Um, Assignment is what you expect, so um, oh, there should be one for M2 here that has to be of the type of C. I'm sorry about that. that there's a typo here. Um, here, if M is a reference to C at alpha, 
then bang m is a reference, is, is a value of type C, so you can interpret it. Um, this one, what does it say? It says if I want to allocate uh, new locations x1 to xn in memory and giving them values m1 to mn, well, each of those locations have to be of type, the type you can store in that location. <coughs> And uh, it can refer to any of the other locations that I'm allocating. Yes? So should the assignment and the reference be T or T or T? This should be T alpha of unit. Yes, you're completely right. I'm sorry about that. Yeah. And this should be a T of type C. Yeah. Great. Yeah. OK. And then the runner T one says, OK, if, 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 uh, if I have some computation of type T alpha of A uh, with some region variable alpha, but gamma and A don't mention this alpha, then can I, I can pretend that M was pure. OK, so now let's look at the semantics, how the semantics work. OK, so. Oop. Oop. Sorry about that. OK, so these guys, these, are, these kinds denote Big product, a category that is the, the big uh, or small product of these worlds. Okay, so it's just a tuple of worlds. It's, each object is a tuple of objects. Its morphism is a tuple of morphism. Uh, types of this kind are objects in the pre shift category from this guy to set. Okay, and all the type constructors are as usual. The only one that's not usual is this guy. And so, how do I interpret the alpha i of a so when you give me some object in this big, in this big category? Well, what I do is. I fix all the all the all the components apart from the ith component. That gives me a pre sheaf of uh, W. I apply T whatever monad I'm gonna have once I find one that validates local uh, effect masking. I'm gonna apply it to this pre sheaf and then I, apply, I I give it this this component I. Okay? So it's a very natural definition to, to do. And then uh, once I have the types I can interpret the terms and the terms are just morphisms from gamma to A. So this is a Haskell, so all the Type uh, the the, mona, the computation is explicit, so I can I can just do this, and then one property you, uh, you can prove about this the semantics is that if you, if I have a weakened type judgment, then this uh, type doesn't doesn't depend on alpha. It's semantics. It's the associated pre-shift doesn't depend on, on the semantic on the alpha, and so it's subject to the effect masking theorem, and so you can factor uh, factor every computation. Of the, uh, of the appropriate types, so that lets you, that gives you the semantics to do run st. Okay, so so okay, so I should really finish. So as I said, this is work in progress. I'm really sorry about not spotting the error before. Um, I, I'm gonna cash in on the this is an informal workshop uh, bit. So I've given you some two not quite monads for so the monads, but not quite for uh, for ground references, um, and I've shown you how the effect masking property can be used to, to run a One thing I should say, though, is, is that the local ground state monad does validate this effect masking, so you could use that to do a ground state run ST, but I think that's somewhat limited. So we're going to finish here. Thanks. <laughs>, yes, so 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 these, these equations are the, the usual ones from uh, uh, if you allocate this and you allocate that it's the same thing as allocating the other end okay. this kind of this kind yes. of very people equation optimizations so that's 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 what I think of when I think of equational theories for for these kind of effects so right, but then when you add the runs T what would then be the question the equations that you would expect I mean somehow so, so, so if if you start adding effect systems on top, which one does kind of give you, right, in this, in this way? Then yeah, it would give you soundness for this effect masking property that you usually have, right? For for uh, if no one else can see, if no one else can see uh, this location, then I can hide it, and then. But I've, I've not gone this path yet. But that's that's the aim of. I mean, that's this, that's the reason I was looking at this this effect masking property as well. Yeah, so it's not it's not just for Haskell. I agree with that. Yeah. Uh, Neil, you had a question. Oh, okay, fantastic. Yeah, just, just a general remark. I think really cool stuff. I hope you can find the right knowledge. Uh, 
So I, I did a similar uh, proof of running a scheme for Coca once in, uh, in the paper using operational semantics. And it's just not beautiful or elegant, but we don't get this, this beautiful uh, uh, insight that you show here in the era of the runner's scheme. So I'm very excited by this work. Thanks. I hope it will work out. Yeah. I mean, I should also say that Paul Levy, I know, also develops yeah, his take on, on a monad for, for these foreground references. So, so hopefully someone will come up with something soon. Because um, I, I want to use this for other stuff as well. So I'm happy whoever, whoever solved this. So if someone's clever in the room is going to solve this, then please do that and let me know. I'm quite curious. All right. Thank you, guys.